Uh, let me welcome you to Oakhurst Baptist Church on behalf of the Kairos Mission Group. We are a group that started about a year ago to uh, work with people promoting peace in Israel and Palestine, and we're happy to have you here as our guests. Uh, Elise Cohen, as most of you know, um, organized this program, and I'm going to uh, let her introduce you to our speakers. If you missed the bathroom announcement earlier, bathrooms are down the hall that way. If you go out this hall and turn uh, left all the way to the end of the hall and then to the right, you'll find the bathrooms and they're freezing cold. <laughs> so hi everybody, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, so before I introduce our speakers, I just want to say thank you to all the, all the people who have sponsored this event. One, for sure, Oakhurst Baptist Church for hosting it. Um, Jewish Voice for Peace Atlanta, there's now a new chapter here. Um, Interfaith Peace Builders, which leads delegations to Israel and Palestine to meet with nonviolent activists there. Um, Joining Hands for Justice Partnership, Israel-Palestine. Um, the Presbyterian Peacemaking Partnership of PGA. And again, this is hosted by the Kairos Mission Group of Oakhurst Baptist Church. Um, we are very lucky to have Maya and Iran here today. Um, we actually almost had to cancel the event because Iran is not feeling that well, but they busted through seven hours on the road and made it here just in the nick of time. So um, let's really warmly welcome them. They've been on the road for a long time. They're exhausted, but they are really committed to um, bringing awareness about what's going on in Israel and Palestine. Um, so Maya Wind is 24. She grew up in Jerusalem during the Second Intifada. She joined the Sheministi movement and helped to establish the 2008 Refusenik group. She refused to serve in the Israeli army and was sentenced to military prison and detention and was exempted in 2009. After her release, she co-led the Jerusalem Alternative Education Program of New Profile, the feminist movement for the demilitarization of Israel. And she also guided political tours in East Jerusalem and the West Bank for the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions and worked against displacement in East Jerusalem with rabbis for human rights. Today, she's active with the Israeli groups Anarchists Against the Wall and Boycott from Within. And Aaron Efrati is 28. He was born and raised in Jerusalem. After graduating high school, he enlisted in the Israeli Defense Forces, where he served as a combat soldier and company sergeant in Battalion 50 of the Nahal Division. He spent most of his service in Hebron, or Hebron and throughout the West Bank. In 2009, he was discharged and joined Breaking the Silence an organization of veteran Israeli soldiers working to raise awareness about the daily reality of the occupied territories. He worked as the chief investigator of the organization, collecting testimonies from IDF soldiers about their activities. He also guided political tours to the West Bank and worked to educate Israeli youth about the reality of being a soldier in an occupying army. His collected testimonies appear in the booklet Operation Cast Lead, and their most recent release are Harsh Logic. And some of you may have seen the Breaking Silence event we had with um, Donna Golan a few weeks ago. Um, his investigative reports <laughs> appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian. And today he's also active with Israeli groups Anarchists Against the Wall and Boycott from Within. Um, before we clap for them to come up and talk to us, I'm going to send this list around. And I would love for you to sign it. And the sponsoring groups will be able to tell you what kind of events we're having about Israel and Palestine. Thank you so much, and welcome our guests. Thank you very much. It's great being here. I'm a little under the water, but I told my uh, on our way that <clears throat> if the Atlanta Hawks Kyle Culver can uh, stand up to the field 90 games in a row and knock down a free throw, uh, free pointer, I can count to the lecture. <laughs> so hi, good evening. I'm Ali Fati. I'm 28 years old. I'm, uh, I'm born and raised from Jerusalem. I'm actually a seventh generation in Jerusalem. My grandpa from my father's side, originally my family is from Iraq, from my, my grandpa from my father's side was uh, uh, born in the old city in Jerusalem. My father and mother came from Iran originally. My mother family came from Hungary after the Holocaust. I grew up in Jerusalem during the Second Intifada in a very regular Zionist home. I don't think there is the concept, sometimes I'm telling it, sometimes I'm not, but now when I'm looking at you, I don't know if you understand, there is no concept of non-being a Zionist in Israel, if you're not an Orthodox Jew, maybe. 
but there is no concept. If you're a Jew, you're a Zionist, and I was, of course, a Zionist. I didn't really understand what a Zionist mean, but I definitely understand what an anti-Zionist mean, and that's anti-Semitic. And I was, of course, a Zionist. My family was a Zionist. My brother was a, an officer in a special unit of the Persians in the Israeli army. My mother was an officer in the army. My father, until today, is the head of investigation of the Jerusalem police. So I'm coming from a good family. <laughs> and I'm uh, I grew up in Jerusalem also with my grandma, who is an Auschwitz survivor, my grandma from her mother's side. She's an Auschwitz survivor. She actually lost all of her family. She and my grandpa lost all of their family. She, they were the only survivors. Coming and growing up with my grandma was uh, a very different concept of growing up as a kid because from a very young age, I was very aware of traumas. So uh, we had a lot of potatoes rotting down in the house and the door had four locks on them at all time. And my grandma used to be very uh, neurotic and paranoid. And she used to tell a lot about what she's been through. And I don't really remember as a kid being very interested about the Auschwitz stories, but I do remember one story that hit me very strong because I was in the same age that she was when she went through it. She was 11 in the ghetto in Budapest in Hungary. And this is the first time she saw Nazi soldiers coming into the camp. And Nazi, Nazi soldiers came into the ghetto and took her father away. And she didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And for her it was a complete shock, maybe more than anything that will happen later on. All the dying and the death she will see around her and all the family she will lose. This was amazing to her because she didn't understand why. It was completely arbitrary for her. And 60 years later she still talks about it like it's completely arbitrary, like we don't know why it happens. Although we know exactly what happened in Europe those years, but my grandma, now almost 90, still shakes when she's talking about that moment. You know, she's, she's saying the Nazi soldiers came in and she just chose him and him and him and went away. And one of these him was her father. And for me, growing up with that, made me, I think, in a very early age, decide that I want to be at the right place of history. You know, when history will knock on the door next time, I will be there on the right side, and I will do the right choices. Like most of my friends in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, in the 11th grade, I went to a trip in a delegation to Poland. For two weeks, we went into a trip all over the camps in Poland to see our history. And in the end of these two weeks, I found myself in Auschwitz, in the same place my grandma was, and actually in the same hut that my grandma used to sleep in. And I found myself inside, and then I get a letter from one of the guides that my mother sneak into the delegation. My grandma wrote it, and it handed to me through my, one of the guides by a secret, and I'm reading it, and it's very emotional for me, and I decided to read it for the guys. And basically, to, it says that, uh, Elani, you have such a big heart, and you're such a cute boy, and you're so sweet, and uh, you're very sensitive. And I feel, although you need to remember the Holocaust very well, it's not your fault. And I feel like you're taking it upon yourself like you've done something wrong. So you can let off of it a little bit and take a step back. It's not your fault. And for me, it was very emotional because I was very emotional invested. And I'm finishing the letter and I'm, I got tears in my eyes and then one of the guys come over and tell me, Elan, you know what your grandma really want to say in the letter, right? And I said, yeah, of course, that I have a very big heart and I'm very sweet boy. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. What your grandma really want to tell you in the letter is mm, that a second Holocaust will happen. And it will happen very soon. And if you don't want to take it upon yourself that the Holocaust is happening, you have to go back home Finish your school and join the best unit you can in the military to stop the second Holocaust from happening. For her sake, for your sake, for your kid's sake. So I did. I said, if this is what my grandma wants, I get it. I went back home, I finished my school, and I find myself joining the army. The IDF. This is me, a young, handsome soldier, <laughs> a promising career in the IDF. And I'm starting seven months of boot camp. And the boot camp wasn't fun. Boot camp was seven months of training for a war. So for seven months, all we did was train for a war, nothing else. We got ready for a war. And I guess I'm, I'm taking a moment upon this situation, about this sentence, a war, because Israel was actually not in a war in the last 40 years. 
right? Since 1973, Israel was not in a war with another country, with another army, with airplanes, with tanks, a war. We got ready for a war, but we weren't in a war in the last 40 years. We did operation. We went into Gaza and fought what we call the terrorist group with Hamas, or Lebanon with what we call the terrorist group in Hezbollah. But we weren't in a war. But this is all we learn about. Nothing about the Palestinians. And after these seven months, I do find myself in a kind of a war, but not in the war they thought about. I'm finding myself in the middle of Hebron, El Halil. Hebron, a very big city in the middle of Palestine, counting something like 180,000 Palestinians, and split in the middle, there's a big settlement, a Jewish settlement, in the middle of the city counting something like 750, 800 settlers. Around them at all times, there's 500 Israeli soldiers. And around us, there's 300 policemen at all times. So why do we have army and police at the same place? Well, because we got two kind of citizens. One under civilian laws, although they're outside of the official borders of Israel. The settlers, the Jewish settlers, are officially uh, an Israeli uh, civilians. And they get the police to protect them or work with them if they do something wrong. And then you got the Palestinians. The Palestinians are living under different kind of law, a military law that we dictate. And all of our job is to control their life. And this is what we do. And I'm starting my job at Hebron. I'm starting to go out and post. And a lot of the posts are outside houses or outside schools in Hebron. And the first thing I noticed in Hebron was that children are afraid of me. And for me, it was unthinkable because I was this young, handsome soldier. You know, and I, I was really cute and I love children. I really do. And I think, I think a, a lot to do with that was the fact that all the time I had my grandma in my head as a little girl. And I love to work with children, I love to be with children until today. And for me it was unthinkable. And I, I know it got something to do with the fact that, you know, I, I had my boots and my uniform and my helmet and my vest and my two hand grenades and my six packs of ammunition and my M16 in my hand. But, but still, you know. I was still the same boy in a costume. And I went back home at the first weekend I got, and I talked with my mom, and I told her, Mom, you know, there's kids in Hebron who doesn't like me. And my mom said, no, Elani, everybody loves you. I said, no, but, but serious, Mom, there's kids who are afraid of me. And she says, well, uh, let's think. Well, what can you do with kids? Kids like soccer, kids like TV, I don't know. Kids like candies. And I said, yeah, yeah, mom, that's a great idea. We're going to bring candies in the middle of Hebron. So I did. I brought candies in the middle of Hebron. And it actually kind of worked. I find myself outside of school, in my post, bringing gummy bears in my vest between my ammunition. <laughs> and the Israeli national snack, do you know what the Israeli national snack is? I know at least one Israeli in the crowd knows what the Israeli national said. What is it? Bamba. Bamba. Guys, don't pass it out. It's the best export of Israel after weapons. So don't miss it out. It's a peanut butter snack, a crunchy snack. It's very, very good. I am really proud of it, actually. I'm not kidding. And I find myself with bags of Bamba on me in the middle of the post waiting for kids to come out of school. And the first time I'm trying it out, the kids are looking at me and running to the other side of the street because they think this crazy soldier is trying to seduce them with something. And after a few days, the first kid is getting enough brave to come up to me, grab the, the bag, and run away with it. <laughs> but then a rumor starts coming out. And a few days later, a little kid around the age of eight, a little chubby kid, is coming out afternoon from his school and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And he's coming up to me and says, Candy soldier? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> and I'm bring out the bag of Bamba, and I offer it to him, and it's, he's grabbing it. But instead of running away, he decided to open it up and offer it back to me. <laughs> yes, exactly. And for me, it was a very, very emotional moment. Because that was the moment I knew I succeeded. I'm really protecting my country from a second holocaust. But in the same time, I'm doing this occupation in a very nice way. And the kids love me. And I'm really doing it. And we're really here together at that moment. So we, we didn't, I didn't really know Arabic except for like uh, strip down and give me your ID. And he, 
really. And he kind of knew Hebrew, so we kind of spoke in Jewish for five minutes, but it was a beautiful five minutes. It truly was. And he walked home, and I finished my eight hours shift, and I was on clouds. I was so happy. And I went back to my base, getting ready to go to sleep, to call my mom, tell her we made it. And I was so happy. And then a bunch of guys from the unit came up to me and says, yo, we're frothy, because this is how we talk in the army. They said, yo, we're frothy, man. Uh, we're sorry, but there's another mission you have to come with us to, tonight. We know you just came down on shift, but we don't have enough manpower, and we have to have you. And you know what? Usually I will argue, but I didn't care, because I just fulfilled my destiny in Hebron, and I was ecstatic. And I said, yes, whatever it is, I'm in. No problem. And this is why we left at 4 a.m. to do mappings. Mappings is something that the army do every night in every city or village or, you know, in Palestine. And basically the idea is very simple. It's a simple militaristic idea. Mapping, saying that you have to go into houses in the middle of the night. And the reason you're going to do it in the middle of the night, it's only because, you know, you want the people to be there. And 4 a.m., 3 a.m., it's kind of a shoe bat, you know. So you're going into the house and you're knocking on the door, jish, army, everybody out, and all of the families coming out in their PJs, outside of the house, soldiers are guarding them outside of the house, and then the officer of the, of the unit with another soldier is taking the father of the family, going around in the house, and starting to take the house down, and looking for weapons, knives, uh, anything that shouldn't be there, and at the same time, there's one soldier who draws the house, actually doing mapping, of the house. And the idea is very simple and for me it made a lot of sense at the time. The idea of mapping is that if ever from that house, that specific house, a terror attack will come out against our soldiers, we will know exactly how the house is drawn, right? So we know there's two windows there and there's a back door and it actually made a lot of sense. And every night we did like three, four house, houses and that night we had to do three houses. It was quite simple. We went out that night at 4 a.m. It was January of 2007. It was snowy. And we came to the first house. Army, everybody out. And all of the families coming out to the snow. And the soldiers are guarding them. And the officer is going with the father. And I was chosen to be the drawing one. And I'm drawing the house. And I'm doing it the first house, the second house, and the third house. And we're supposed to go back to the base. It's 5 a.m. But the sun didn't come up yet that night. And my officer decided, you know what, guys, we can spare one hour of work maybe tomorrow. Let's go do another house real quick before we're going back to the base. And all of the soldiers start arguing, but not me, because I was still thinking about this chubby boy. And how tomorrow I'm going to be there outside of school, and I'm going to try to meet him again. And I said, come on, let's do it. And completely randomly, arbitrarily, just choose the next house over in Abu Snena neighborhood in the middle of Hebron and we walked into the house everybody out we're going in the soldiers are guarding the family outside the officer is going with the, fam with the father of the family and another soldier is trying to take the house down and I'm doing drawings and I'm drawing the living room and the kitchen and then in the corner of my eye I see a puppet of Winnie the Pooh you know Winnie the Pooh? I love Winnie the Pooh and I start walking toward the puppet and I noticed that instead of drawing the house, I'm drawing Winnie the Pooh. And I'm going into what seems to be a children's room. And then I see him. I see the boy from this afternoon. And he's standing naked. Next to his bed. And he's looking at me and he's shaking. And I start shaking also because I didn't really understand what's happened. And I'm just standing there and from instinct, I guess, I'm raising my gun into his head. And I'm just standing there shaking for something that looks like an eternity, but it probably was like 20 seconds. And he starts peeing his legs. And at some point, the father of the family is going back with my officer and he sees what's going on inside the room and he's running inside the room. But instead of pushing me back, he's taking his kids and starts slapping his kid on the floor and slapping his kid and he's looking at me and saying, please don't take the child, please, I will take care of him, I will take care of him, don't take him away, we will punish him, I don't care what he done, 
I will punish him, don't take him, don't take him. And I'm just shaking there, so I'm moving my gun from him to him. And I don't understand why, why did it happen then, just that day. And at some point my officer is running into the house because it's into the room because he's hearing the screaming of the father. And then I guess, I guess he thought the father is, uh, is acting kind of suspicious, you know, because I don't know why is he slapping his kid, maybe he got something to hide. So we did what we do with every guy that is doing something suspicious inside of Palestine. You arrest him. And it doesn't matter if it's, he's 8 years old or 85 years old, it's the same way always. You handcuff him behind his back and you put a blindfold on his eyes. And it's always the same. So we're tying the father away and we're throwing him into the army jeep and we're just driving away. And we're getting into the base and we're putting the father in the entrance of the base, tying up, and we're just going to sleep. And I'm going to sleep and I wake up and the father is still there in the entrance of the base. And I'm going down to my shift and I hope that I won't see the child. And I come back to the base and I'm going to sleep and I wake up and I'm going to the shift and I come back and the father is there for three days. He's sitting handcuffed to the entrance of the base. And after three days I'm getting a phone call from my dad, who was the head of investigation of the Hevron police, of the Kiryat Alba police, the settlement next to it, at the time. And my father is telling me, congratulations son, me and mom heard the IDF spokesman announcement about how your unit arrested a terrorist this last week. And I guess that was really a shame. So all I could really say was, thank you. It was really scary. But after I'm hanging up the phone, I'm running into my officer's room, and I'm telling my officer, man, what are we gonna do with the father in the entrance of the base? And saying, which father? I'm saying, the father, the, the guy, the guy that we arrested a few days back in the entrance of the base. Oh, oh from the mapping, the guy. Uh, yeah, you can release him, it's okay. I said, what do you mean you can release him? You know, we probably want to transform him to a, to a better unit or police or investigation, right? Because it's suspicious. I said, nah, come on, that's cool, go, go release him. So I'm going out of the room and I'm releasing his hand and his eyes. And I'm letting him go out and he's running back home. And I'm, then I understand that because I was so excited that night, because I was so emotionally disturbed that night, I didn't fulfill my mission. My mission was to do the drawings for a terror attack that will happen, right? And I didn't finish the mission because I didn't bring the, the uh, drawings into my offices to get it filed. So I'm running into the room and I'm getting them. And I'm running to my office and I'm saying, I'm really sorry, but here it is. Here is all the drawings. I'm sorry, it will never happen again. Here, go file it. And my officer is looking at me and says, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool, man. Yeah, you, can, you can throw it. Uh, what do you mean? I said, no, that's fine, that's cool, you can, you can throw it, that's, just come on, get out of the office. I said, wait, 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 but this is our mission, this is what we're doing here, right? So where, where to put it? I will put it anywhere you want. I said, that's fine, just throw it away, come on, stop bitching, get out of my office. I'm saying, well, I don't understand, but this is not our mission? Then my officer is looking at me and saying, Efrati, you're not in booth camp anymore, come on, grow up. And I'm saying, what? I said, Efrati, since when is the Israeli army in Hebron? I don't know, since the 90s? Since 1968, okay? Since 1968, it's 40 years, we're doing mapping every night, three, four, five times, okay? For 40 years, that house that you broke into was already broken into a thousand times before in the last 40 years. And then I understand. The first crack of many will happen in my head. And I understand that you cannot save your country from a second holocaust and be a really nice soldier. You just can't, because occupation is not so nice. And shock points doesn't have smiley faces on them. And I'm going out of his office. And I'm just continuing to do the same thing, but I'm just shutting it down. I'm completely turned off in my mind. And I'm doing the same arrest and the same breaking into houses. And I'm breaking in protesters. But after something like four months, I'm completely out of it. I feel like emotionally I'm on the edge completely. And I'm calling a friend from back home. 
is an older friend and it's kind of the lefty friends of the guys and the only reason we keep in touch with him is because he's really good in basketball <laughs> but everybody thinks it's really crazy and I'm, I knew he will understand and I'm telling him that I'm really on the edge I really am on the edge and he's telling me, well Iran, if you really dare why not going out next Friday and coming to a protest with me with anarchists against the wall and I'm saying, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Anarchist against the wall, the guys with the shit on their face and that throw stones at soldiers. Are you crazy? I said, yeah, yeah, okay, but what do you got to lose? And I understand that I really don't have a lot to lose. So I'm leaving that Friday and I'm putting my uniform in my bag and I'm taking civilian clothes from my bag and I'm putting it on me and I find myself in Tel Aviv going on a bus to build in a small village also in the middle of Palestine and on the other side of it more close to the north of Palestine, that is demonstrating weekly since 2003 against the separation wall that go exactly in the middle of the village, taking half of the land and the olive growth of the village to the other side of the wall, what was then a fence still. And I find myself standing in Berlin in a Friday noon, and I am so scared, because it's the first time I'm in a, in a Palestinian village, but I don't have my M16 on me all my hand grenades, all my uniform, and I really am scared. And we start marching into the fence, and there's drums and people singing with posters, and we're marching into the fence, and then I see a bunch of guys from the side throwing stones, making the kids throw stones also, a bit ahead on the road, and then, from nowhere, tons of army units around us, in 360, surrounding us, start shooting at us at the protest. And I was so scared, because I shot at protesters before, but I was never shot at before then. And I was so scared, because it was a rubber bullet to our body, and tear gas canister to our legs. And the shooting is beginning, and I'm so scared that the only thing I can think about doing is just stand up and screaming, Stop shooting! Stop shooting! I'm an Israeli soldier! I'm an Israeli soldier! Stop shooting! And one of the anarchists against the wall is looking at me like this. <laughs> and then he says, I'm an Israeli soldier too, stop shooting! <laughs> and then a bunch of Palestinians are coming from the back and saying, Yeah, we're all an Israeli soldier too, stop shooting! <laughs> but for me it wasn't funny, you know, because they didn't stop shooting. And the tear gas started kicking in. And I don't know if you ever tasted tear gas, but it's terrible just choke you up completely. We tried it at booth camp, but it was nothing like it. It was much stronger. Tear gas around us, clouds and clouds, and I cannot breathe. I, I feel that I cannot breathe anymore. And my instinct is to start running, but it just made it worse. And I'm finding myself on four in the middle of the village, choking up until one of the Palestinian men is coming from behind and just grab me and continue running until we get to his home and put me in his home until I feel I can breathe again. And then I understand that everything is changed in my mind. I'm going out of the protest back to my home in Jerusalem, but come Sunday and I'm coming back to the army because it's the only thing I know is true. You know, this is what my parents knew is true, this is what my friends are doing, and I'm doing it also, but I knew I have to do something different. So I'm getting in touch with some of the anarchists that I met, and they bring me in touch with Doctors Without Borders in Israel. And Doctors Without Borders in, in Israel are in a very specific condition, because they're sitting in Tel Aviv, and they can take permits from the army for Palestinians that need to go through checkpoints into Israel or in the West Bank to hospitals or get medicine, but they cannot reach them to bring them their permits because the Israeli uh, civilians cannot walk into Palestinian city, it's illegal. So they got permits for them in this game of democracy that they got from the army that really care about Palestinians, but the army not allowing them to go meet them. And this is how I find myself in the next year, standing in Hebron, in South Juan Hebron, sneaking in the middle of the night into houses in Palestine, giving permits and medicine to civilians to go into checkpoints, go into hospitals. After this year, I'm releasing from the army, and the day of my release, I'm joining Breaking the Silence, a group of veteran soldiers that collect testimonies from all over the West Bank, from soldiers in the West Bank, and publish it 
for the Israel public and abroad and doing tours and doing lecture. And I know that in the minute the Israeli public will hear my story, the occupation has to end, right? The occupation will fall. But nothing happened. And I'm collecting more and more testimonies and we publish it, but nothing happened. And then start Castlet. In 2009 or end of 2008, Operation Castlet in Gaza, it was so bloody and so terrible from the side that I knew I have to meet soldiers who are there right now. And I find myself going up to the border with Gaza, standing on the Israeli side of the border and waiting for soldiers to come out. And they do. And some of them are coming to talk with me. And some of them is very confused because they were getting ready to fight a war. And all they were training to do was fight a war. And they walked in with tank shells, bombing everything inside, and airplanes flooding the area. And white phosphorus burning everything in sight. But instead of an enemy for their war, they just saw hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of dead bodies around them. And they came out confused, not all of them, but some of them. And I'm collecting their testimonies and we're putting it into a booklet. And we know that this is it. People will see this booklet and everything will have to end. But before we publish it, we want to make sure we got a good platform. So we're calling the lefty newspaper in Israel. Who's the lefty newspaper in Israel? Oh, it's... And I'm talking with Amos Saleh, the military reporter. And he's telling me, listen, these stories are amazing. If you can verify these stories, you're getting a cover story. So we do. We verify it. And a week after that, it's supposed to come out a cover story. And we're waiting. And the day of its arrival, we're going out to stores and we're buying all of the copies of Alex. But there is no cover story. And there is no backstory or middle story. And we're going back to the office and we're calling Alex. And they're telling us, oh yeah, so basically we got a call from the IDF spokesman last night. And the IDF spokesman told us we got two options. Or we're going with you, or you're coming with me. But if we're going with them, we're breaking the silence, they said you cannot work with me anymore. And you know, in Israel, we don't really have investigative reporters, you know, maybe except for Amira Haas. So all of the channels, all of the news, rely on the IDF spokesman to give us the truth from Gaza and the West Bank. So Alex decided to go with them because otherwise they don't get a job. And I'm sitting in the office and I'm flipping through the booklet that the Israel public will not see anymore. But then I noticed there's a lot of stories missing from the booklet. And I'm going to my boss at the time, to Yudah, and I'm telling him, hey man, there's a lot of stories missing from the booklet. And he said, oh yeah, sure. This is why the idea of censorship took down. And I'm saying, what? He said, yeah, yeah, you know, every, every news channel in Israel, every channel, every media, internet website, uh, you know, radio, everything have to go through the idea of censorship. I said, okay, this is amazing. We don't have free press, but, but we're breaking the silence. Right? This is what we are, we're breaking this silence. He said, oh, yeah, sure. We're breaking this silence that the idea of censorship allows us to break. And I understand we're just going in circles in the last two years. And after a few months I will leave breaking the silence and I will continue to do the same job. Only this time I'm doing it on my own. I'm going out to the West Bank, I'm collecting testimonies, I'm collecting stories from all over the political and all over the security industry in Israel from very high rank men and women. But instead of going back to breaking the silence, I'm going to the New York Times, to the Guardian, to the Washington Post, to the BBC, and all of them are publishing a lot of stories, a lot of important stories. But as I'm going deeper and deeper, more and more I find out that all I'm getting hit with is money. It's not really occupation, for say, or power, it's money. And it's more money and more money. And then I'm getting into an amazing story. I'm getting into a story about how Israel just sold in 2010 a new tear gas canister to the government of Singapore. And this tear gas, tear gas canister, according to the news, is so good, is so strong, it's better than any tear gas canister in the past. And this time, they promise, it will choke you up so good. And in their world, it's the most deadly tear gas canister ever. But then I understand that if they ever sold it to the government of Singapore to fight down their 
protesters, they had to try it somewhere. So I'm doing some more research and I understand they did try it. They tried it on us, in Berlin, and in Yalin, and Kadum, and Ebi Salah, and all through the villages in the West Bank where the protests are going through. And I'm going deeper and deeper and I understand that, wait, it's not an occupation. It's a lab. It's a big lab. And sometimes, as a soldier, I was the, you know, I was the doctor that infused the poison, but sometimes, as a protester, I was the lab rat with the Palestinians. And there's more and more weapons that being tried on us all the time. Actually, I'm going deeper and understanding the last 40 years, Israel was involved, and this is just a partially list of dictatorship and regimes that Israel officially sell the weapon to, train, or not officially, officials from the army, the IDF, went out of their service to train these units, these regimes. And more weapons, and more weapons, and I understand that we're the fourth in the world in weapon trade. And we're doing billions every year. And then I understand another thing. I researched it, and I got to know that, you remember the guys that threw stones in the beginning of the protest? They were not Palestinians. I find out there's an undercover unit of the army that looks like me, some Arab Jews that go into the army doing disguise as Palestinians in the villages and starting riots. So the army will have a good excuse to start blowing the place up before they sell weapons into other dictatorships. And the more I research, I understand that I'm not standing in the right place. So I'm leaving Israel and I'm coming to the belly of the beast, to New York. And after a few weeks in Harlem, one of the neighbors is knocking on the door and he's asking us if he can sleep over because his house was just broken into by the NYPD because they were looking for marijuana. I was saying, yeah, sure, come in, man. Tell us what exactly happened, and he does. And it sounds really familiar how they break into the house. So I'm doing a little more research, and I find out that NYPD got an office in Tel Aviv. Now, I didn't mean to tell that, but two weeks ago, we were on the road, we were on the Maryland Highway on the way to Washington to do these lectures, and we total our car in the middle of the highway. We've been to a car accident, and it sucks, but uh, everything was okay, and everybody was fine, and we total our car. And it was in the middle of the highway, and the Maryland police had to come, secure us out of the highway. And they tow our car, and the policeman of Maryland police gave me a ride with him until the lot. And we start talking along the way. And the Maryland police officer is telling me, so man, where are you from? And I'm telling him, I'm from Israel. He said, oh man, you're bad asses. You got it made. People in your country do not raise their head. You know how to civilize them. I wish our people would be like that. I'm saying, well, man, I don't know if you know a lot about Israel. I don't, I don't think it's exactly like you think. So, oh, no, no. I've been to Jerusalem a lot of times. I'm saying, what? Really? I said, oh, yeah, we're training in Jerusalem. I'm saying, what? I said, yeah, the Maryland police is training with the Jerusalem police and the IDF. Guys, you are so cool. We are going to do your method here on these people. And we continue talking after five minutes. Apparently, he knows my dad. From the Jews and Poles, it was completely unreal. My dad was supervising them. And then I decided to change the end of the lecture completely. Because in the beginning, I would say, the Palestinian situation is a humanitarian crisis. And we, all of us, need to be on the right side of history. It's not an Israeli situation or a Palestinian or Jewish. It's a humanitarian crisis. But you know what? Now, I don't care if you think that or not. You cannot care about the Palestinians. And you cannot care about us, the Israelis, who want the militaristic state and the ethnocracy above their head and get away with us. Don't care about us anymore. But please, guys, care about you. Because you are next in line. Because they, the government, the police, the army, they organize globally to oppress us. And we need to organize globally to resist them. And this is why you need to join us for the boycott, divestment, and sanction call from 2005 of the civil society of Palestinians against the state of Israel. We want to cut it from the source, from the money, because we want to globally resist them, because it's affect you every moment. You're next. Thank you for your time.
follow, right? Yes. So I always regret speaking after Iran. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Maya. Uh, and like Iran, I'm also from Jerusalem. And like Iran, I also grew up in a pretty uh, typical Zionist family, nothing <coughs> out of the ordinary. And yeah. mostly... <laughs> 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 Primarily what that meant yeah. in a Zionist home for me was that I had one thing very clear in my mind for as long as I can remember, and that was one very simple understanding, which was that the Jewish people could only survive in one what? way, and one way only, and that was segregated, effectively cut off from the rest of the world um, in a sort of self-imposed ghetto, in a way, um, that we could protect ourselves. Because after years of persecution and genocide, this was really the only way for us to survive as a people. Um, and I remember um, one of the first moments where this conception of reality started to crack for me. And that was when I was a senior in high school and I found myself in, sort of by coincidence in a village called Nealim, which is not far from the village Bili in the Iran Stovel. Also uh, undergoing the same situation and many protests as well, because also the separation barrier is taking effectively and annexing a lot of their land and their olive groves into Israel. And they also have weekly protests for many years now. And I find myself there and the tear gas and the rubber bullets and everything that Iran was describing. And amidst all the chaos, I suddenly have a moment of clarity, which is that I'm not the one actually behind walls. It's actually the Palestinians closed up in ghettos, allegedly for my security and my safety. I, on my side, can roam totally freely. And this was really um, confusing to me because it was so contrary to the way the narrative that I was brought up in. So I was very confused by this. And so I had a started to ask a lot of more questions, and I came to regularly join protests and direct actions in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and came to see with my own eyes what the military is actually doing. And so then, a few months later, my own draft date uh, was drawing near. In Israel, uh, the conscription is mandatory for all Jewish citizens, men and women, as well as some non-Jewish minorities as well. And um, by the time my own draft date came, it was clear to me that I could not join an occupying army, that I would not do this to my Palestinian comrades who I was protesting with on a weekly basis. And luckily I wasn't the only one. So I got together with nine other peers um, from around the country, and together we formed a third letter of um, refusal of high school seniors in the history of the state. And I actually know that we have somewhere here someone who was a member of the second letter of the, third, of the, of the three that we've had in the history of the state. So it's actually, um, you're really meeting today two of like a, really a handful of Israelis um, that have done this. And so um, we organized together and wrote a petition. And, um, uh, this is, I translated um, a paragraph of the, of the petition, but the gist of it is where high school seniors resisting the draft refusing to serve our petition. And so um, we went outside high schools and we started to sort of recruit, so to speak, people for our movement and try to get people to join. And our premise was very simple. We said if we create a mass movement of refusal, um, then the occupation will collapse because there will be no one to man it. And so about four months into mobilizing, we looked around and we realized we're still the same 10 people. I know. So we realized it wouldn't, we wouldn't quite cut it in terms of taking down the idea of ambitious <laughs> I know. Um, but we said, okay, we're a few, but what we can do is make as much noise as possible. And that's what we did. And so what we did, we, start, we took our petition and we circulated it. We sent it to the government. We circulated it in Israeli media. We got extensive coverage from really pretty much all Israeli media, as well as international media also. And um, each of us, in turn, the day of our draft, went to the induction base with a small protest with, uh, of our, with members of our group, as well as in, uh, members in solidarity with us and against the wall. And we came for the, to the induction base and refused um, service. So as it happened, my draft date um, was about 10 days into CAST-LED, just by coincidence. And so it was a very controversial time to be refusing. And I remember the, moment of the, the morning of my draft very clearly to this day. 7.30 a.m., we're in Tel Aviv, we're marching up to the induction base, and I feel two things very, very strongly. The first is a deep, deep sense of conviction. I could not have felt more certain that I was doing the absolute, the only right thing to do. Um, although Iran's valuable testimonies about the, sort of the extent of what was going on in Gaza was unavailable to the Israeli public through Israeli press, what was available was the rising death toll. And I was horrified. And I, I had to use this platform. I had, this was my moment to shout out to my fellow Israelis and say, what are we doing? This is crazy. And I needed this. I really needed this moment. I was very grateful to, to have it, to have this moment of protest, to call out to my, to my fellow citizens. But at the same time, I felt the deepest sense of shame that I think I've ever experienced. I felt like I was turning my back on my people, on my grandparents who had worked so hard to establish the state for me, 
Um, and, and really, I was turning my back on everything that I, would, I had been brought up to do, which was serve and I protect need some water. the Jewish state. Nonetheless, I went through with it. We arrived at the induction base. I went in, um, and I went under, already that afternoon, um, had my first trial in the military court system, uh, what would be one of five, eventually. And I spent four months sort of being shuttled back and forth between um, military detention centers and, and mili women's military prisons. 400, um, which you, this is a facility that I was kept at for most of the time. And I want to share with you just one anecdote from prison because um, it shaped a lot of my worldview, and in particular, it shaped a lot of the activism that I'm involved in to this day. So I want to share some, in, some stories with you. So about a week into prison, I was struck by something very interesting. I was struck by the fact that I was the only Ashkenazi Jew in prison. So for those of you not familiar with the internal ethnic composition of Israel, of Israeli Jews, rather, um, it's a common misconception that most Israeli Jews are white. We're actually a minority. So Ashkenazi Jews refers to Jews of European background, like myself. So on one side, I'm from, my grandparents are from Switzerland. On the other side, my grandparents are from Eastern Europe. And we're actually only 40% of Israeli Jews. So where are the other Jews from? Well, we have a large Ethiopian community um, in the last two and a half decades or so. Um, since the fall of the Soviet Union, we have a, a massive immigration over one million um, immigrants from the ex-Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. Um, but the, really, the majority of Israeli Jews are actually Arab Jews, like Iran's from Iraq meaning Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And in the entire women's military prison, I was the only Ashkenazi Jew. So I'm sure for you this is not a surprise, because I'm sure you're all aware of who does and does not get incarcerated in the United States. <laughs> but at that time, I was not as well aware, and I, politically I was not as informed, and especially around this issue. And I was really struck by this. So I sort of started to talk to my fellow inmates, and we had a lot of time to kill, because we spent the better half of the day locked away, and it was getting pretty boring. And I got to know my, inmates, my fellow inmates, especially my cellmates, very intimately. And um, you know, one of the first things that we asked each other was, you know, what are you in for? It's an awesome conversation starter. If you ever find yourself in prison, guaranteed to work. What are you in for? <laughs> <laughs> Try it out if you ever get a chance. So I asked my fellow inmates, you know, what are you in for? Why are you here? And I was really struck by their answer. Their answer was that almost all of them were jailed because they had deserted or abandoned their posts. They had began their service, but at some point had left. And why did they do this? They did this because they could not afford to serve in the military. So the draft is very much discussed. What's less discussed in Israel, but also certainly here, is what compensation young Israelis get for two or three years at least, minimum, of, of labor. Um, and the answer is not much. So the average Israeli soldier, unless you're a combat soldier or a military career soldier, but sort of, and for your basic service, the average soldier across the board, and particularly women who are relegated to doing sort of clerical work, um, receive about one tenth of the Israeli minimum wage, which is about sixty dollars a month. That's what that's what we get. So these are women who were relied upon as income providers for their families, often single mothers, had to help their siblings get by, and $60 a month just wasn't going to cut it. And so they, had, they were literally, um, they ran away, were later captured and jailed as a result, basically being punished for being poor. And this led to my second moment of clarity, which would later really come to inform a lot of my activism and my worldview about the issue. So when I first started um, organizing around Palestine, I, had, I, I was against the occupation narrowly construed, sort of as the military occupation of 1967, so um, Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem. But once I was in prison and, and through reading after, I would come to understand that the problem is much more systemic and much more structural. The problem was Zionism. And Zionism was a movement that from the get-go was not, although I had been taught, was meant to serve and to provide a safe haven for Jews from wherever they are and whatever color they are. Um, this was actually not at all true that the Zionist movement and Israel only provided that security and that safe haven for Jews who looked like me, for Jews who were from Europe. Um, but we are actually the minority of Jews. And so this really um, would inform a lot of how I came to understand the bigger issue at hand, which was really not about the military occupation, but rather the, Zion the Zionist movement and the settler colonial structure of Israel as a whole. So I left um, military prison, and I, I, one of the first things that I wanted to do was, not, was also broaden the scope of my activism. So not only to work in Palestine to, to work with my Palestinian comrades, but also to work around the issue of the military, and especially the, and to address the heavy price that Israeli Jews are also paying for living under the thumb of the military. So I joined New Profile, which is a feminist movement for the demilitarization of Israeli society. And what we do is we are a, uh, a movement, we have branches throughout the country, and we do two main things. One is we have a, an ongoing educational campaign around militarism. 
drawing Israeli attention to the fact that not only Palestinians, but also Israeli Jews are living under the thumb of the military. And what consequences does that have? What consequences does that have for women's issues, particularly violence against women, um, but not only? What, what kind of, how does, it, how does the military um, permeate really all aspects of what should be civil society? And what effects does that have for the labor market, for, for internal racism within Israel, um, for class? And, and so we're really trying to raise awareness to, for all, to all of these things. And the other thing that we do is we try to provide alternative education for Israeli youth, the kind of education that I wish that I had had as a child myself. We, that's what we try to provide for, for others. So we, I co-directed the uh, Jerusalem Center for Alternative Education at New Profile. And what we do is we have we brought together um, youth, youth, mostly teenagers in high school, um, for weekly sessions where they would have discussions and we would expose them to you know, critical and, and more uh, alternative discourses that they, could not, that they would not otherwise be exposed to. And we also try to provide a, a, a forum where they can raise questions or concerns that they might have about their upcoming military service. Because the military comes regularly into Israel um, from very early on. And in fact, from the beginning of your drafting process, it usually begins at age 16, your military property by Israeli law. And, 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 you are, and the military regularly comes to recruit and to discuss. But what youth don't have and they often crave is a space to talk about it in a more critical format and to raise concerns that they might have about this. So that's what we try to provide for you, and we have centers like this all over the country. And I'm going to I'm going to show you one slide that I think, in a very succinct way, um, sort of uh, demonstrates why we at New Profile feel there's such a dire need for alternative education. This is a picture taken from an Israeli kindergarten four years ago. I translated the Hebrew, but I'm going to walk you through it nonetheless. It starts with the question, "Who wants to kill us?" And then, from right to left, a list of people who ostensibly fit this description starting with Pharaoh, right, going back to the Old Testament, Greeks, Haman, another biblical figure from the book of Esther, uh, Nazis, pretty self-explanatory, and then Arabs. You know, just that, you know, millions of people from around the world that we can just categorize into what Arabs, one word. And then you have the arrows, right, lest you be confused about what, what's, what's to come. And then the question is, what do we need? What do we do about the situation? We need a state. Big, bold letters, you can't miss it. We need a state. Um, looking back at my 12 years of education in Israeli um, in Israeli schools, and I think I can speak for Iran when I say this, this pretty much sums up the message. This is an overarching narrative that m most Israeli children, as well as adults, unfortunately, subscribe to. The Jews have always been persecuted, always will be, through no fault of our own, certainly not with regards to the Palestinians. Um, and, and so this is, whatever we do is always going to be for our own survival, um, basically a response to existential threat. And so this is what we were trying to provide an alternative discourse to at New Profile. So when I first started working at the profile and I first left prison, my initial analysis was, wow, the occupation of Palestine really relies upon a particular economic arrangement, namely exploitation of, of, of Israeli labor. Um, and and, and that's sort of, that was my understanding. But when, upon researching this further and kind of working uh, with New Profile and kind of digging deeper into the different elements of the military and the ways it permeated all aspects of the state, um, I actually came to understand it was really the, more the other way around which is to say that the Israeli economy as a whole um, relies upon the occupation of Palestine. I'm going to give you five key points just to illustrate to you a sense of what, what I mean, why I'm saying what I'm saying. So the, the first aspect is the economy of the occupation um, of, is the economic exploitation of Palestinian labor. This is not, I think, discussed enough, certainly not here, and I want to draw your attention to a few issues about this. So I don't know if you can see this well, but on the left-hand side here, you see uh, it's an image of Palestinian workers lining up. It's dark outside, and that's because it's 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning. And Palestinian workers are lining up uh, to cross checkpoints. That's, what, that's where they're standing. In order to either cross over into other places in the West Bank to work or into Israel proper to work. And what kind of work do they perform? Well, they perform the kind of work that Israeli Jews don't want to do. For example, construction. Israeli Jews oversee construction, but we certainly don't do construction. So here on the right-hand side, you see two pictures, that, and I chose them. Um, with care, because here you're actually seeing Palestinian laborers working in the West Bank. And what are they doing? Preparing foundations for the separation wall, which you can see the 20 foot concrete wall behind them, and building settlements on expropriated Palestinian land, settlements that they could never live in. So even um, the checkpoints and, and, and settlements and the wall are often, cre are often actually physically constructed by Palestinian laborers. Um, and the reason that, that the wall and the checkpoints also have a lot to do with the exploitation of Palestinian laborers is because um, it's always rendering them uncertain and because there's always a, a sort of um, cycle of people who are getting permits um, to go in and out. 
and you not you can't know when you do get one and when you don't get one. And very often, Palestinians find themselves needing to go in illegally, that is, without permits. So they sidestep the wall, they sidestep checkpoints, and they enter into Israel illegally. According to IDF um, numbers, statistics, uh, 80,000 Palestinians are at any given moment inside Israel doing work illegally. And so they're particularly vulnerable to exploitation because they really they have no leg to stand because they are illegal workers and they have they're in a very precarious situation. And many Palestinians are are often go days without being paid. And the reason they're so desperate and still continue to come into Israel to work is because unemployment in Palestine in the West Bank is about 70 percent and poverty is severe. And so they have really few other choices. And so this is just one. So just to, to give a sense of that, uh, there's a whole um, sort of slave economy that we have running from construction to cleaning to cooking, all of these things that are underpaid in Israel are predominantly performed by Palestinian laborers. Number two, um, economic exploitation of natural resources. There are several natural resources that Israel regularly extracts from the West Bank, but I'll just mention one which I think is most key, which is water. So on the left-hand side, you see Ma'ala Dumim. It's a um, Jewish settlement. It's a suburb of Jerusalem. It's a city of 50,000 people. It has five swimming pools and lush green gardens, as you can see from the picture. This, on the other hand, can everyone see this? On the right-hand side is Susia, it's a Palestinian village in the South Mount Hebron Hills. It's about a mere 20 minutes away from Ad Adumim. This is their water situation. Um, so for the dry season, which unfortunately in Israel-Palestine can last up to five months of the year, they don't have enough water for drinking, let alone for agriculture and their other needs, which, you know, for, for, for daily subsistence. Um, so 80% of the water that falls, <coughs> the rainfall that falls in the West Bank is redirected by Israel into Israeli settlements or into Israel proper, uh, leaving only 20% for the Palestinian population. <coughs> Third, I'm just going to flag this. I can speak to this more in the, in the discussion if you want, but I'll just going to flag this issue. Uh, controlled population, so private security, the wall, and checkpoints. Israeli contractors as well as multinational corporations made a fortune off the of the construction of the wall, um, um, construction of the, set the uh, checkpoints, um, the manning of the checkpoints, and all of the um, machinery that is involved in all of these things. So. Multinational corporations and Israeli corporations um, were profited very greatly from this from this project. Fourth, um, Iran mentioned this, but I wanted to say a few more things about it. The weapon industry in Israel. So the the Israeli weapon industry is the fourth largest in the world, which is quite impressive given our size and how recently we've become a state. It generates over seven billion dollars annually in exports alone. So not weapons that we produce for our own use, but weapons that we produce to sell abroad. And it provides employment for the country's military elite, as well as for hundreds of thousands of average Israeli citizens who work in these plants. And at New Profile, it's another part of what we talk about um, when we talk about militarism in Israel, because um, a military career is a very lucrative thing. Of course, mostly uh, Ashkenazi middle class men get to do it from the, from the get-go. But it's a very lucrative thing, and, as, and, you, and it's Why particularly lucrative because try? you finish your, uh, you get to retire you usually at around the age of 45. So in addition to your very handsome um, military um, uh, pension, you also get to have developed a second career. So what kind of second career? Well, as an Ashkenazi middle class male who has been in high rank in the military, you have a lot of options. So it can, you can go into politics, you can go into high tech, um, you can go into, say, running things like schools, hospitals, um, or uh, uh, you know elderly homes because obviously if you're if you're fit to run a unit you can obviously run a school right so <laughs> that that is the logic and and many of many principals in Israel have uh, are actually career soldiers and so uh, really from from the public sector to the private sector to politics um, really the entire Israeli society in, in many ways is actually run by these generals um, in all aspects of it. And so, and it, but if you if you don't care for any of these options, you can go for the most profitable, which is going into the weapon industry. But if you don't want the weapon industry, you can also go into what's called the other part of the security industry, which is the fifth and last part of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the economy of occupation. So, specialized equipment, military knowledge. Um, I I like to give some examples just to give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about. So, first of all, drones. Um, the United States is still the global leader in drones. Give you that. Um, but Israel's not far behind and it's very key in, in developing and, and manufacturing of drones. Um, another thing that we do, for example, um, Iran spoke about the sort of laboratory that we have. So uh, another example of this is, if not from weapons, but actually from the security industry. Um, for example, uh, Israel developed a special computer device that is attached to a camera that was initially used in checkpoints throughout the West Bank and Gaza. And the computer device gives you an analysis of, based on how furtive the uh, person's movements allegedly are, is this person a risk? Is this person a potential terrorist? So this was initially developed in Israel, used extensively for several years in the West Bank and Gaza, and then later Israel exported abroad. Where? Well, for example, the United States. Many airports around this country 
have this device and, and use it, you may not see it, but it's there behind walls. So this is just one example, and there are really countless of such examples of sort of security devices that Israel has developed. Um, similarly, here in the center of the picture, you see it's a picture of a mock Palestinian village. It's actually, they really tried to make it authentic and everything with it. You see a mosque there. And it's a real-sized Palestinian village built in the Negev, in the south of Israel. And um, the Israeli military trains here in counter-insurgency, uh, urban warfare, and not only the Israeli uh, military, also the American military. So troops before they're deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan have stopped over and trained in these, and this is actually one of several um, mock Palestinian villages that Israel has built in the south to train a variety of armies and groups in counter-insurgency. And really, Israel has, in recent decades, really been um, marketing itself as the sort of global leader in counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, based on our home lab that we have, so we can try so many things on and gain this expertise through. Um, and we've been making a fortune. Not only the military leader of the country, but really the state as a whole has been making um, a killing, literally, off, these, off this industry. So just to give you a sense of the, sort of the extent of what we're talking about when we talk about the economic incentives to continue this occupation on, on, on for Israel as a state. So I'm going to end um, really soon, I promise, just a few more words about the group that Iran and I are representing today, which is Anarchists Against the Wall. Um, and the group that we are representing is really the only um, Israeli-Palestinian collective that does direct action on the ground in a non non-hierarchical, horizontal way um, in which Palestinians really lead and we are uh, joining them in solidarity. And so uh, for years, the group was established in 2003, and ever, and ever since really the popular resistance movement has, um, and, and protests around villages in the occupied territories um, have started, and we have joined them for years. And so um, these are images from Benin, uh, the village Iran mentioned before, so this is us marching up to what was then a fence. This is the tear gas um, that was tried on us. And this is what we do, and there are over a dozen villages that we regularly work with on daily and weekly basis, and we join them all the time. Um, in protests and direct actions. Another thing that we do yeah, um, is uh, direct actions in terms of trying to take the, take the law into our own hands, hence the name Anarchists Against the Wall, and defying the Israeli military law, which we don't recognize, um, and helping Palestinians get around. So we've taken down parts of the separation fence when, when we can. Um, it's not always easy. We remove roadblocks. The IDF regularly puts roadblocks um, or flying checkpoints around uh, you know, um, to, to make it difficult for Palestinians to, to be mobile, and so we move them whenever we can. We show up, we, we're on the ground, we do the actions, um, and that's, that's what our group has been about always. Um, another thing that we do is educational displays within Israel. We feel it's our duty, really, as Jewish Israelis, predominantly, to educate our fellow Israelis and to remind them that there is an occupation going on a mere 20 minutes away, because sometimes um, in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, you can sit in a cafe and it's easy to forget. So this is a, just a thing we did in Tel Aviv. We closed off a street, and this woman was on her way to work, very confused. Does not everyone just go to work really easily and directly and not having to sidestep all sorts of barriers and checkpoints and go through humiliation? No, actually, the truth is not. And 20 minutes away from you, it's not the case. So that's, that's the kind of work that we try to do, even educating our, our peers in Israel. Um, but we're here primarily because um, all of this action, activism has a cost, and especially for Palestinians. So we're here to fundraise for Palestinian political prisoners. As of September, this September, there are 5,007 Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli detention uh, centers and, and prison facilities. 180 of them are children, that means under the age of 18, and 31 are actually even under the age of 16, still held in Israeli detention facilities. 137 of them are under administrative detention, and the Israeli military law enables uh, Israel to capture and detain a Palestinian up to six months without trial and often without being told what they're accused of because it's classified information. And so the catch here is, though, that every six months this period can be renewed indefinitely. And so we have comrades of ours, Palestinians, who are in prison for more than uh, several years already now, who have not yet seen a judge. But just to, to an asterisk about this, um, not that seeing a judge in the Israeli military court system will do you much good, um, because it's sort of a, a facade, really, of a legal system in which the um, uh, prosecutor and the uh, uh, defense attorney and the judge are all IDF soldiers with law degrees. Okay, and so, and it's really not really a semblance, sort of Kafkaesque situation. Uh, and so the conviction rates, accordingly, in the Israeli military court system is 99.9%. .9%. So you don't have much of a good chance anyway as a Palestinian um, entering this court system, but, some, but um, this privilege of even going through this trial is uh, not even granted to all Palestinian prisoners. And so, um, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to do a shameless, to a, a shameless promotion. Uh, we're going to pass around a basket, um, and 
uh, we would appreciate very much um, any sort of donation, even a dollar or something. Um, we don't have any overhead in charge, we're not an NGO, no one is getting a salary. Um, all of this money is going directly to the legal fund that the Anarchists Against the Wall co-managed in a totally democratic way with the um, popular uh, resistance movement of, in Palestine and, and members of villages across the West Bank. And um, the legal fund basically sustains, uh, it gives bail money for when, when we need it, which is often, in the military sets high bail, and also provides, um, uh, helps to fund the, the lawyers. We have a team of Israeli and Palestinian lawyers working day in and day out to help uh, give aid to our Palestinian comrades, and sometimes to Israelis, and sometimes to internationals. So, just, just to say, if any of you ever find yourself in Palestine, ever in a protest and ever arrested, it's our team of lawyers that's going to get you out. So whatever investment you make tonight is going to come back to you tenfold, guaranteed, um, because Israeli detention facilities are not fun. Spoken from experience, so don't do it. You want to get out of there fast, so donate. Please. <laughs> um, so, no, but, but seriously, please donate because um, our fund is depleted and, and we really have Palestinian comrades. Um, and, we, and our movement needs to continue. There needs to be this on ground resistance um, to, <coughs> to end. And so, we really rely on the lawyers to get us out and to get the Palestinians out in particular. Um, so, I'm going to pass around a basket. We're also selling t shirts, um, one of which I'm modeling for today, but we have several designs and several sizes. Um, so come see us at the end if you're interested in a t-shirt, and again, all the proceeds are going directly. And also, if you want to make a tax-deductible donation, um, you can, because we have a tax exempt status here in the States. So, um, the, oh, and also, just two more things. If you want to uh, read more about this, um, two websites that I particularly want to refer you to. One is the Palestinian Call for BDS. So please read, this is the original boycott, um, call for boycott from Palestinian Civil Society from 2005. It's a fabulous website, it explains what the idea is of this movement. This movement is gaining traction worldwide, also in the States, um, and it's a really exciting time to join this movement. And the pressure is being felt, I can guarantee this. In Israel, the Israeli media is obsessed with it. Everyone is talking about it. The pressure is being felt, so now is the time to join um, this very strategic um, and, and nonviolent movement that, we're, that, that you can all be a part of. And if you want to particularly tap into um, the United States activism, besides reaching out to the organizers here who are involved in many ways, you can look at the um, U.S. campaign to end the occupation, Israeli occupation website, which is a coalition of over 350 members, or, and you can kind of browse through the different organizations and see how you can get involved. Um, and at least you want to make a pitch for that? Or? And there actually is some information on the tables about U.S. campaign and occupation and many of the organizations that are doing that. Right. So um, thank you so much for listening. And uh, I think we'll open up for discussion. Thank you. <laughs>